you ever so much for inviting me back to talk about my favourite subject, something I'm very passionate about. And what I thought I'd do was to start off by kind of giving you a rundown of what we can expect this evening. First of all, um, my background. Well, I started life as a professional wine taster. Um, but I'd always been interested in health foods and whole foods, and back in the early 60s, this was quite a cranky idea. In fact, there was a restaurant in Soho called Cranks. Um, for those of you familiar with old cars, you'll know that a crank is a very small thing that once you set it going, starts much bigger things. And I went into my first health food store in Wallington in about 1961. I went into the health, into the wine trade, but really my calling uh, was something else. And so in 1980, I was a customer in a health food store in Cheltenham, and the chap said, he said, look, I'm starting a company. He said, uh, we're going to manufacture vitamins and minerals. Would you like to come and join us? He said, I can't afford to pay you until we get the company established, but I think you'll enjoy it. And I just leapt at it. I lived on my savings because I just, this was something I grasped with both hands. It wasn't a job. As Angie will tell you, generally, people that run health food stores, it is a calling. We feel we're very lucky to do what we do. So, what are we going to do this evening? Well, I work for a company called Nature's Own, began in 1980. We're entirely owned by a charitable foundation, and we do all sorts of things. One of the things we do is we work in South Africa with patients who have tuberculosis. And to give you a flavour of what is to come, tuberculosis patients on, on drugs, they get a 56% success rate. When it's complemented by nutrition, that goes up to 78%. We can learn a lot. A couple of old adages. We are what we eat. And let food be your medicine. I saw a quote recently, and I'd like to read it out to you. It'll tell us quite a lot, and I think it's quite accurate. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. I thought, yeah, that just about sums it up for me. We live in one of the best fed nations on earth, yet one of the least well nourished. I read the other day that the chief medical officer of the World Health Organization said, the age of medicines as we know it is drawing to a close. So this evening is about what has happened, where we are now, and what we can do. In part one, it's our start point, what we've actually got to work with, and that's our body. How we got here, that's what's happened to food over the last 60 to 80 years. Then as we denatured our food, we discovered nutrition, and we're going to look at what is a balanced diet. The story of nutrition and something called the nutrition gap, that is the gap between what we should be getting and what we actually do get. And then a simple list of common ailments and what nutrients can help. Part two I've entitled, Are You Sick and Tired of Feeling Sick and Tired? This will have more on diet, including something called the Paleolithic diet, that's the Stone Age diet, exploring a number of nutrients in more detail and what they do, and looking at some ailments including stress, IBS, weight loss and things like that. All of you will have a goodie bag on your table in which there is a sample of multivitamin and mineral and a very thorough book on one or two other things. At the uh, break, you're very welcome to come up and see there's all sorts of items that we have here. 
on specific topics and you're very welcome to take those away. And also on the uh, table are some samples of B complex and vitamin C and a multivitamin aimed at senior citizens. So in a sense, you don't have to remember what I'm going to say. Okay, nutrition in the modern world. Feel good, stay on top, what good nutrition can do for you. Our start point is what you've got, and it's what we take for granted, and that is our body. I call it the eighth wonder of the world. Some people take more care of their cars than they do of their body. Let me give you a few simple facts. First of all, if you could put all the cells of your body end to end in a single continuous strand, they would stretch as far as the moon and back. Every day, lots of cells come to the end of their cycle. Millions and millions of cells come to the end of their cycle and are discarded, whilst other cells are born. Some cells will live only a few hours. That's their job. Others, in the brain, and in my case I'm not sure about that, will be with you for life. But in general terms, you are a, a, a completely different person physically to the one you were seven years ago. You give birth to a hundred billion red, red blood cells every day. By this time tomorrow, your heart will have beaten around a hundred thousand times. You've got over 600 muscles. <coughs> You make a litre of saliva every day. Your lungs, the surface area, are large enough to cover half a tennis court. When you smile, you exercise 30 muscles. And whether you know it or not, that actually, when you smile, it triggers off endorphin activity in the brain, which are good opiate-like substances that actually make you feel better. So it's a good idea to smile. I know we don't do it in this country. I go to India a lot. And people in India just walk around and they're all smiling. They're all happy. They haven't got anything the way that we would understand it. But they are very happy and they smile. Here we've got everything in the way of material goods. But we never smile. You have copper, zinc and nickel in your body. And gold in your toenails. So don't discard those clippings. <laughs> 60 years ago, people had up to three times the nutrition we're getting today. I could go on. I wrote an article once called The Eighth Wonder of the World, in which I list listed 50 wonderful things about the human body. But I think you've kind of, you've got the picture. Um, the capillaries, the very thin blood vessels, if you put those end to end, they go around the world two, two and a half times. Now, this is what we've got, and we take it for granted. And yet, do you know that the human body is programmed to live to 120 in good health? Normally when I say 120, I hear groans from the audience. Oh, no, no, come on. No. But I mean in good health. And why don't we? Well, first of all, can you hear me all right? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, we used to die from infection or trauma. Now we die from the effects of civilization. That really is lifestyle choices. Poor nutrition, lack of exercise, smoking, People say, but we live longer now than we used to, because they point back to the Victorians. Yes, but you see, in the Victorian times, we didn't understand germs. We didn't understand hygiene, not until the 1870s. Infant mortality was very high. But if you go round to lots and lots of graveyards, you will find that actually people live to quite an age. In essence, we are the product of the genes we inherit, our environment. When I was at school, they used to talk about the Roman emperors. 
And you think back to those Roman emperors and how unbalanced they were, and then you think, yes, they transported their water in lead conduits. Now we know, of course, there's a link between lead and brain damage. Our lifestyle and lifestyle choices, believe it or not, the way we think. It is a fact that people who are stressed live up to 10 years less than those who live a comparative stress-free life. <clears throat> the food we eat, this is, <laughs> it's got a mind of its own. Did you read a few years back about the disparity between people living longer in Glasgow, uh, sorry, a lot longer in Dorset as against Glasgow? Up to eight years longer they worked out, and that's all down to diet. Um, I watched a TV program once that showed that as you went further north, there was less fruit and veg sold. And of course, we all know the old joke about salad in Glasgow is a battered fried Mars bar put in the fridge overnight. So, having gone through those, let's look at a bit more about why. For hundreds of thousands of years, we were hunter-gatherers. And then we became farmers. Yeah, sounds about right. Then we got the Industrial Revolution. We moved to towns. We no longer had fresh food because the food had to be shipped into the towns. Then we got electric light. So we, be, we have developed an artificial lifestyle and we are the generation out of all our predecessors, hundreds of thousands of our ancestors, we live the most unnatural life that any generation has lived. Our minds can cope, just about, but our bodies are saying, what's going on? This is not what I'm meant to be doing. So we try and compromise. Nature's rhythm. In the old days, you used to kind of semi-hibernate in winter and you were out all hours in the long daylight hours getting in the, the, the harvest. Um, we have a much more sedentary life style. We've had pollution. Pollution has come about. It started really in the Industrial Revolution. I can remember as a small boy the great smogs of the late 40s and early 50s. And you know that that saw off a lot of people. But another thing we've got is something called free radicals. These are stray splinters of chemistry that are caused by the Earth's natural activity and all sorts of other things, and they career around and they're invisible. They penetrate us, and because they are splinters, our body doesn't know what to do with them. They need to be neutralized by the free radical scavengers, the so-called antioxidant <coughs> nutrients. That's vitamins A, C, E, and the two minerals, zinc and selenium. They're the ones, particularly selenium, that will carry them out of the body, where they career around doing a lot of damage while we've got them. And we're bombarded by more of those in the time it takes me to say this sentence, millions of them, than one could ever believe. Processed food. A whole industry has come about in the last 80 years, which has taken the food away from us, altered it, and then sold it back. And I remember reading many, many years ago about the famous cornflakes trial where they had two groups of control rats. One they fed on cornflakes, the other one cornflakes packets. The one fed on cornflakes didn't do so well, but the nice glossy coats on those that ate the cardboard packaging, that was something that got a lot of attention at the time. Then we've had the changes in farming methods. Back in the Second World War, we realised how important it was to feed ourselves. And so the directive at the end of that, that, that war was we had to feed the nation at any cost. 
hence the idea that we could kind of conquer nature, that we could get out there with all sorts of herbicides and pesticides and we could actually tinker and alter and grow all sorts of things and the fields would be abundant. You know and I know you get something, you never get anything for nothing. You've got to work with nature and that's what happened. We need, we need and vital for health, 22 different minerals. The body can't make these, it has to get it from the food that it eats. You need 40 to actually function properly. We return three to the soil, nitrogen, <coughs> phosphorus and potassium. And it is recognised widely that we are deficient in many of the minor nutrients, in fact some of the major ones. Here's a, a few facts for you. Even as far back as 1912, Dr. Alexis Carroll said, life will either be healthy or unhealthy according to the fertility of the soil. These two statements were said in the US Senate, and remember, we follow <coughs> the US. Most of us today are suffering from dangerous diet deficiencies and we are being starved by food grown on mineral deficient soil. That was said in 1934. In 1988, the Surgeon General concluded that 15 out of every 21 deaths involved nutritional deficiencies. When the world leaders all gathered for the Rio conference in 1992, it was all agreed there were 76% less essential minerals in the soil than 100 years ago. The government has two, a, a firm of scientists called McCants and Widdowson, and they measure the content of soil for nutrients every few decades. And taking 1936 against the 1980s, there was less than half the calcium, less than half the iron, and less than half of the magnesium and potassium that were in the soil back in the 1930s, and it's only got worse. To put it in context, 80 years ago, one apple provided a third of the recommended daily allowance of iron. Today, you would have to eat 26 apples to get the same amount. Sobering. Um, <clears throat> here's a few quotes. The only man ever to win the Nobel Prize twice, one for his work on vitamin C, was Linus Pauling. And he said, you can trace every sickness, every disease, and every ailment to a mineral deficiency. The Prince of Wales, bless him, said, the soil's health is our health. Yet we have eroded it and poisoned it and failed to replace lost nutrients. In one pinch of soil, there are more microbes than there are people on the planet. So in essence, that's where we've got to. One of the best fed, but the least nourished nations. We are a product of a food experiment that has lasted 80 years and I think we're just beginning to kind of wake up to that more and more. We have a culture now of cheap food. When I was a boy, the purchase of food would cost over 30% of the budget, the household budget. It's now about 12%. I don't think that's good. For many, many years, remember I've been doing talks like this for, well, since the early 80s. Things have moved on a lot as we wake up. And I used to talk to people about trans fats and hydrogenated fats, and they used to look at me blankly. You go into Marks and Spencers now, and you see a big sign saying, we're going completely hydrogenated fat free. Because the body doesn't know what to do with hydrogenated fats. It gets into the system, and then it stays there and clogs it up. I read that 50% of hospital beds are given to sufferers of dietary problems. In each of us, there are 500 accumulated toxic compounds. There's a booklet here issued by the Food Commission 
and it says, by the time she's 17, she will have eaten her own weight in food additives. Believe me, it's going to get better, honestly. Um, all sorts of things you read of in the papers every day now, like aluminium is implicated in breast cancer. In short, we are in uncharted territory. When you don't respect something, you can't relate to it. We've moved away, many of us, from the soil. Imagine you live in Brixton or Stockwell or somewhere like that. You know, what kind of chance do you get? They did a big survey of school children and many, many children hadn't got a clue where food came from. They thought potatoes grew on trees and all sorts of things like that. And you ask a lot of young people and they'll think of food as fuel and nothing more. Not what we deem it to be, which is nourishment. So that when all these cells die, they can be replenished by good cells. Because the body can only do what it can with what it's got. It has a mechanism for healing. You cut yourself, you heal. The body can, has this strategy to try and do the best it can with what it's got. But of course, if you feed it junk, you're going to wind up with a junk food body because it can't do anything more than that. Child deficiencies, government's own st uh, statistics here, done by MAFH, Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. I won't go into it in too much detail, but they show that children between 10 and 15 were measured for five vitamins and two minerals. There was not one case where one group got 100%. In the case of girls and things like iron, 0% got the RDA. It made truly frightening reading. Um, copies are available. <clears throat> Hyperactivity. Can we remember when all this business about hyperactivity came about? We now know it's linked with things like fizzy drinks. We became associated with Professor Bernard Gesch, and he worked and did a big trial at the Aylesbury Young Offenders Institute. What he did was he had control groups there, and he fed them different things, the one that came out best was fed on a whole food diet with supplements like zinc and B vitamins. And even the staff remarked that their behaviour, their attention span, their concentration, they were noted for their lack of aggression. So much so that this was a peer-reviewed studies and it went to the Home Office and is currently being studied by the Home Office with a view to implementing that more, because it shows that if you eat junk, then what you get is things like people who are hyperactive, who have aggressive tendencies, can't concentrate, and so on and so, so forth. Now, I painted a kind of picture because I needed to get to where we are now. As we denatured our food, so we discovered new, new nutrition. And what is a balanced diet? Well, I could, if I had a pound for every time I heard someone say, oh, I eat a good diet, then I'd be immensely wealthy. But the truth of it is, I wonder if any of us can get a really good diet. We're recommended to eat five a day. Do you know why it's five a day? Because that's all they think that we'll be capable of. Not one control group that they measured actually did and all does eat five a day. Um, young men get 1.2 portions of veg and fruit a day. But hardly anybody gets five. And they settled on five because they knew it was hopeless to ask for more. In Japan, you're recommended to have 10 portions a day. Bridging the nutrition gap, that's what we're all about. In this booklet, I think it's in the ones that you have as well, there is a chart called the Food Guide Pyramid. And it shows here, down at the bottom, 
water, vegetables and fruits. We go up then through things like legumes, nuts and seeds, gradually up through fish, eggs, poultry, finally red meat, animal fats, dairy sweeteners and refined confectionery. Now, many people I know, the pyramid is actually the other way up. But, the key to this is the quantity. Down at the bottom, lots and lots of fruit and veg, that's live food. Things like nuts and seeds, dormant food, then up at the top, you've got dead food. So it's worthwhile looking at that. <coughs> They're now saying that there are links with cancer and red meat. Um, for what it's worth, we were involved with somewhere called the Bristol Cancer Help Centre. The patron is Prince Charles. And the Bristol Cancer Help Centre was set up by some holistic practitioners who had been told by their doctors that there was nothing more that could be done for them. But they believed there was. And they got a Dr. Alec Forbes, who was consultant physician at Plymouth Hospital, to be their medical director. And Alec said, when people went along, he said, I know the three things. First of all, the diet. Get them on fruit and veg and wean them off what they've got now. Second thing is, always, if invariably, they're short of essential nutrients, vitamins and minerals. Third thing, get them thinking right, positively. We then stand a fighting chance. A doctor, because we, we do work with a number of very forward-thinking doctors, one doctor said to me, he said, patients will do absolutely anything to get into good health except change anything. Yeah. Changing ourselves and our attitudes is a very big thing. And I am not about absolutes and extremes. I'm a great believer in a little of what you fancy does you good. But it's changing away from whole one thing, bulk of one thing, to something else and saying, okay, now instead of having chips every day, I'll have it once a month. Because if you say to people, like, you've got to change this, and no more teas, no more coffees, no more this, they say, I can't cope with that, it's too much. So you've got to be gentle and encourage. Nutrition is complementary, not replacement or alternative. It is complementary. Nutrition began, I suppose, with the early pioneers. And that was, it started with the surgeon, James Ling, who sailed with Captain Cook. And he found that if he fed the sailors citrus fruits, they didn't get scurvy. And that's why the Americans came to call us limeys, of course. Then we fast forward to the 20th century. And then, you know what human nature is like? We like to break things down, find what it's made of. And so the pioneers of nutrition looked at various foods that they knew had an active effect on the body and to find out what it was. And they called these things, as they were discovered, vitamins. After the two words, vital for life, amine, the chemical family, it got shortened. As they were discovered, so they were numbered alphabetically, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, and so on and so forth and we'll be talking about these later. In fact, there are some lesser known vitamins that go all the way up to the, to the letter U. Then we got the recommended daily allowances. Now, how did we get those? This was before the Second World War, when it was realized that, you know, we're gonna to have to stand alone, um, we're gonna to have to send young men off to war. What was the barest minimum needed to stop people getting ill. So they got control groups and they established the recommended daily allowances. The control groups by today's standards were woefully 
woefully small. For example, with vitamin C, the control group was 10. They were prisoners who volunteered. It would have been 12, but two escaped. So we've got very small control groups that would be laughed out of court nowadays, fixing something that somehow and was never intended to be fixed in stone. But these RDAs, recommended daily allowances, are recognised as not being anywhere near the amount to actually put us into peak health. Can you overdose? On every jar, it recommends what you take. You know, if you overdose, you can overdose on potatoes, on water, on chocolate, whatever it is. And I saw this headline. Good old Daily Mail. Can vitamins do you harm? And I've seen another one that says, killer vitamins. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I investigated it. The news all came out a bit later. And I did a newsletter. A newsletter. Antioxidants in cancer. Researcher admits she got it wrong. It was news again when it was first revealed three years ago. And it was news again last month. Antioxidant vitamins can speed up the development of cancer. But the researcher who first published the study has now admitted it, she got it wrong. The original study made headlines around the world, found that cancer patients who took vitamin A, that's beta carotene, or vitamin A supplements were 40% more likely to suffer a recurrence of their cancer than those who didn't take any supplements. But the researchers, from the Quebec Research Institute who published this study have reanalyzed their data and have discovered they got it wrong. The only people who were seeing their cancer return were smokers who refused to kick the habit while they were receiving radiation therapy or chemotherapy. The well-respected Copenhagen Institute did a meta-analysis. That means they gather all, of the, all the trials and they analyzed them. And they concluded the same thing. But when this was probed, they found that they'd only included trials where people died. So out of several hundred trials, they carefully selected 48. And the cause of death was again never actually identified. But of course, the press likes a story. So I feel very sorry for us as a public because one day you read something like that, and the next day you read teenage girls' junk food diet leaves them starved of vitamins. We don't know where we are. It's a big picture, but we do know where we are because, ladies and gentlemen, we are searching. <coughs> we are far more advanced than we were. 30 years ago, when I started out, 20, 10, even 5 years, I have seen a huge change begin as people are waking up to what's going on and we're finding out more and more. And the internet is there as a wonderful way of researching information. And of course, if you've got a good independent health food store and you're lucky enough to have one, the people in there, they know what's going on. So. In essence, when did you last hear of someone dying from going into a health food store? No, neither have I. Because it doesn't happen. But you do get all these scare stories. I'm going to talk for a minute about calcium. Because calcium is a really big thing. Bear in mind that... Um, you know, calcium is a very important, it's a macro mineral, and we need it. Um, if you go to your doctor, you'll probably be prescribed calcium carbonate <coughs> tablets. If you've got osteoporosis, you'll get a gram of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is chalk. I have never seen a recipe, have you, that says add chalk. 
because the body doesn't understand chalk and it's not a very good way to get calcium. What about from milk? Well, first of all, cows do not lead the nice rural pastoral life that we like to believe. They have become intense production machines and they have antibiotics and the first thing that your body will do upon getting a dairy product is start producing mucus to line your intestines. The calcium from milk is very, very poorly absorbed indeed. And I'm going to talk about that in part two as well. The, um, the archers, which some of you may well listen to, um, the, the um, agricultural chap who's um, Graham, Graham Harvey, who's their advisor, um, has written a book called We Want Real Food. If you can get hold of a copy, really, really do. Um, he talks about what's called type 2 malnutrition, which is what most of us suffer from. Um, but he says, it's a national disgrace that you can go into a supermarket and buy a pint of milk for less than the price of a packet of crisps. This culture of producing cheaper and cheaper food completely devalues food in the eye of the consumer. It accounts for the way we've come to accept that a bottle of designer water should sell for twice the price of that pint of milk, which is so revealing about the value we place on the animals that produce the food we eat. He goes on, real food means real food from farms. It's about restoring farmers as the principal food providers in this country and as the principal health providers. The food industry has stolen agriculture's gifts from nature. It's time for farmers to claim them back. Here, here. Where calcium is concerned, the RDA, I think, is up round about a gram. Now, an elephant, remember the elephant's got huge bones, tusks, produces six sets of teeth in its life, it munches away at vegetation. It only gets a couple of grams of calcium a day, double what we're supposed to take. It's the form that the calcium is in. It's in green leaves. The body understands it. It's not a chemical isolate. It's not calcium carbonate. It's much better understood and absorbed by the body. Think of the cow. The cow ruminates, it chews the cud, it's got big bones, bigger than ours. Where does it get it from? From grass. We're not programmed to eat grass, but you get the picture. If any of you ladies have been unfortunate enough to take iron, generally the type prescribed by a doctor, you'll have got iron sulfate. Iron sulfate is again a form that is very difficult for the body to comprehend and absorb. Its side effects are, of course, you get constipation and an upset stomach. We've moved on an awful lot to the field of nutrition since these forms of nutrients were discovered. And that's the difference, largely, between what you pay on price, the things you find in a supermarket, you find in a pharmacy and you find in a health food store. You, you pay for what you get. It's the form that it's in. Nothing in nature works in isolation. The humble tomato has the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals, and what's called associated food factors or phytonutrients. It's got 10,000 of those. They're all bonded at a cellular level. It's those that are responsible for the absorption of the, the, the food. In 1989, um, a scientist called Blobel won the Nobel Prize for discovering that, that it's these, these associated food factors that act as chaperones that take it in. But what we've got is, since the discovery of nutrition. Back in those early days, when they identified the nutrient, they extracted it from food. 
All the scientists found that once they'd done that, it was not nearly so well absorbed or active. So to compensate, we produced mega doses, big doses, in the hope that with this sledgehammer approach, more would be absorbed by the body. But in food, when we're designed to eat food and get our nutrition from food, in food, the body understands it and the absorption is so much higher. So what's happened over the years as the field of nutrition has moved on is that people have said, how can we make these things better absorbed? And the word chelation comes to mind. Chelation comes from the Greek meaning claw. So a chelated mineral is a lot better than a calcium or magnesium carbonate, for example. But then we move beyond that and we got what's called food form, where you grow back the nutrient into the food as a concentrate where you find it in nature. So you would grow beta carotene into carrot concentrate, vitamin C into <coughs> citrus pulp. And that form, food form, is the same form as food, so the potency is much lower, so they'll be much more absorbed. It, you, know, you pay for what you get. The very latest thinking goes one step even beyond that, called whole food. There's a species of broccoli called Brassica juncia. You know, broccoli is very good for you because it's got lots of receptor sites in the cells for nutrients. And Brassica juncia is, has this in abundance. And they used to grow it on polluted sites, waste ground tips and places like that, because it would take up all the heavy metals from the soil. You then have a clear site, you can plant what you, you like. Then a clever person thought, if it can take up heavy metals, can it take up good minerals? And the short answer is yes. So what happens is they grow the plant, they feed in the good minerals. When the plant's fully grown, it's harvested. It's dried, it's powdered, and it's put into a vegan capsule, truly whole food. So all the time, this thing is moving on. For what it's worth, incidentally, the word natural in law is meaningless. Okay? A gallon of petrol is natural. A piece of plastic is natural. Anything is natural. So when you see that word natural, you mean it doesn't mean very much. So I'd like to just give you a few snippets here of absorption and what nutrients can do for you. For you. <coughs> Research shows that 500 milligrams of vitamin C a day can cut death rates by 50%. We, on average, get one-tenth of that in our daily diet. Research again shows that 260 milligrams of vitamin E a day reduces the risk of heart disease by 50%. On average, we get less than 10 milligrams. The World Health Organization says we need 2 to 4 micrograms of selenium per kilogram of body weight a day. The average UK diet, because we're very deficient in the UK on the selenium, is just 39 micrograms for your entire body per day. Getting stuff from food. You'd have to eat 10 pounds of spinach to get 50 milligrams of magnesium. Incidentally, you know they used to say spinach is so good for you because of all the iron? <coughs> it was a misplaced decimal point, which has since been rectified. Where I'm getting towards, ladies and gentlemen, is no matter how well we eat or we like to think we eat, there is this thing called the nutrition gap. We are deficient, the World Health Organization, World Health Organization says this quite clearly, we are virtually all deficient in one or more nutrients, micro or macro. And it's a whole cascade effect because it only takes one to impact on all the others. For what it's worth, here's a few deficiency signs. Okay? <clears throat> Incidentally, if you get too much beta-carotene in your body, 
you start to go orange. Many, many years ago, I read in the newspapers about this chap who was fixated by beta carotene. Beta carotene is a precursor. That means it changes to vitamin A when you take it into your body. And if you take ready form vitamin A, it's more difficult for the body to handle. Beta carotene, which of course you get in carrots, is really good for you. And this, this chap, he was drinking carrot juice and eating carrots, and he turned orange and he died. <laughs> Efficiency symptoms, look at your tongue each morning. The state of your tongue will tell you how you are. It always shows up, if it's, if it's, poor, if it, if it's poor, it's a lack of B vitamins. Got the shakes, lack of magnesium, white spots on nails, um, lack, of, lack of zinc. Your body is 70% water. 80% of the brain is water. We're very bad at telling ourselves about water. We need to drink four pints of water a day, ideally as water. Dehydration, we don't register very well. The first we know about it is when we're just about to keel over, over. Your kidneys will recycle 10,000 litres in two weeks. Shall I draw to a close? Right. Sorry? Briefly. Okay. I'm going to start part two with a list of, um, and there's a sheet up here, a general guide on various um, ailments and what can help you, and I shall go through that. So what I'm going to do is, as I draw to a close in part one, say there is a whole range of literature up here, please help yourselves, and it's on specific subjects like IBS, eczema, osteoporosis, arthritis, there's more general things. There is a very handy therapeutic index which tells you well, hundreds of conditions that you might have and what can help. I do write for a magazine called Bore to Life from time to time and there's some copies of that there. Um, so please come up and help yourselves and then we will carry on at 9 o'clock. Thank you so much for your attention.